what's up, everybody? This is Maggie Reichard, pronouns she, her, and you are listening to Nursing Uncharted, the podcast that delves into all different types of nursing while we have uncharted conversations in the process as well. Thank you so much for listening today. Wherever you're listening, YouTube, Spotify, um, Apple Podcasts, thank you so much. And be sure to subscribe to our channels or leave a review. We I read those, and uh, we at the Nursing Uncharted team reads those in order to tailor the podcast to be better for you guys. So um, this podcast today is sponsored by AMN Passport. AMN Passport is an app that AMN has created. To um, It's a comprehensive app. It's very highly rated, and you can book all of your assignments. You can manage everything all from your phone. You get instant job match notifications from the app. So it's a great app if you um, are interested in traveling or um, are currently traveling. Go ahead and check it out. So we are talking about nursing school today. Nurses in class right now are our future, and we want to nourish them. We want to encourage them, lift them up, let them know there's a light at the end of the tunnel because they are in the thick of it. You know, we want to give them tips. And I thought that it would be fun to talk about how to survive nursing school with an old friend of mine, a nursing school buddy, and now nursing professor, Brittany Roberts. So Brittany is currently a professor for a BSN program. She graduated James Madison University with her BSN, and then she went the cardiac nursing route. So she works a few different cardiac units, specifically coronary care unit, cardiac cath lab, and then she went to cardiac surgery ICU, which then kind of doubled as the COVID ICU at her hospital like many ICUs did. And while working at the bedside, she discovered a love of teaching both new grads and students. So she pursued an MSN in nursing education from Duke University so that she could further explore that passion for education and help usher in the next generation of nurses. So Brittany, it's great to have you on today to talk about this and relive maybe some of our memories. (laughs) (laughs) I was actually... We would uh, wind back in nursing school and I'm there by choice, you know? (laughs) Yeah, right. I chose this route for myself. (laughs) Yeah, how has that how has that transition back to class been from being bedside for so long? Imposter syndrome is real. Yeah. For sure. Um and I think it really hit me when I was grading like an assignment for the first time. Um it mm-hmm. was like a paper or something and um I asked my like my mentor, my course lead person, I was like how am I supposed to do this. And she was just like, Oh, just go off of the rubric. And I'm like, yeah, but the rubric just says like well-developed, formulated, thoughtful, et cetera. I'm like, it's all subjective. Yes. I'm like, like, I'm the person to decide this. So that was probably, um, the biggest like imposter syndrome issue that I've had is going off of like grading things. Cause in school, they don't really teach you how to grade things. Right. They teach you how to create those rubrics. Yeah. But not really be the person to grade it. You're probably thinking about like, you know, nursing school, you being like, (laughs) what grounds do you have to stand on for this? Like I wrote this with my blood, sweat and tears. Right. (laughs) Oh, so that has been a challenge. Um, but Going to clinical and teaching students in the clinical setting has been so much fun. And it's yeah. something that I'm like pretty comfortable with. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> sorry. Um, so like going in and actually being able to be like, oh, you like knock on the door, introduce yourself, you know, all those steps yeah. that we talk about. And then being able to like show them that in person and, you know, show them that it's not just a robotic sort of way of stepping through the process you know you can add your human perspective to it yeah so yeah because I feel like that's so law you know I as nursing nurses and nursing students we just like are trying to check the boxes and you know until you actually apply it and get in there you know it just seems like this step-by-step instructions that you have to do when like it's probably really nice to like yeah pull that humanity like back into the practice and show them you know this is what it actually looks like yes because we can practice on mannequins all we want but like every single checklist that they have for whatever skill they're performing is knock 
introduce yourself, perform hand Mm -hmm. hygiene, provide privacy, ask name and date of birth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then when they see it in real life, they're like, oh, that kind of flows better than what we were anticipating. So Instead of like, now I'm going to ask you for your name and your date of birth. And please look at, let me see your wrist. (laughs) Yeah. Oh, I know. I... Gosh, this episode has been getting me to think about, you know, our experience in nursing school and like, you know, I just feel, I feel for all the nursing students out there, they are in the thick of it right now. You know, it is not easy by any means. I tell them almost every day, I'm like, I do not envy the situation that you are in right now. It's like, (laughs) yes, I went through it. Yes, we've all been there, but I don't envy it at all. It's hard. And that's an understatement to say that nursing school is hard. Yeah. I think we really leaned on each other. I was before this episode, we had a Facebook group, like, like our, our cohort was very tight knit. It was like our, you know, there was 60 of us. And I think we were the last 60, like before the, before the program expanded into 90. So it just like felt more intimate and like, we had a Facebook group. We were like talking, you know, just like sharing study tips or like where we were going to be, you know, at like whatever times. And I feel like you you need that. You need those people and those support that support like that really helped me when I was going through. I definitely agree, because it's like even as, you know, actual nurses now, you can come home and you can, you know, kind of vent about things that happened at work to your significant others. Um, But unless they're in the healthcare field, they don't quite get it. Yeah. And so like calling, you know, I'll call my friend Mallory sometimes from my first job that I worked as a new grad and just be like, hey, like this is what happened. And she gets it on a different level than those outside of the practice do. And I think it's the same with nursing students. Like from the outside world, they're like, oh yeah, like it's, you know, tough. It, you're in school, like, you know, suck it up, buttercup. Yeah. But like yeah. your your cohort actually knows, oh, yeah, like this assignment's due. We have three exams. Like all these things yeah. are kind of falling into place. And, you know, it's that support group that you can really lean on. Yeah. Yeah. Do you feel like the students that you see are exhibiting that same type of, you know, support among themselves? Or is it like, has it been more kind of you know, spread out or. I think it's hard to get that level of companionship that we had at JMU because, you know, the majority of our class was living in Harrisonburg, like in the student housing. Um, We were typically, you know, 20 to 22 ish range. Like we were all pretty close to the same like groupings as people. Like we didn't have, Mm -hmm. or for the most part, we didn't have like husbands and children and yeah. You know, all that. So we were kind of in the same like classification. Chapter of our life. Exactly. You know. yeah. Um, but the program that I'm teaching now, people are a little bit more spread out and a little bit more diverse, which I think is great. Yeah. Um, but I think it's hard for someone that is married and has children and has, you know, another job and everything like that to be close to the population that's early twenties maybe yeah. still living at home, really no other obligations. Sure. Um, but I think it's I think it's good to get that diversity because everyone brings their different perspective to the group. Yeah. Um, and I've heard that they do still have like the Facebook groups and group chats and everything like that. And I try to encourage that. Um, yeah. On day one of at least my clinicals, we, for the sophomore group, at least we go over PPE. And so like, donning and doffing those yellow gowns and Mm -hmm. I get pictures of them in it and then I create a group chat and send them all the pictures and then that way they already have their phone numbers their names and everything like that um I quickly remind them to remove me from that group chat so it doesn't like (laughs) you know spill into something else (laughs) (laughs) but yeah I mean I definitely encourage them and something that we did as a group um that I have as a professor also encouraged is do you remember us doing the study guides in google docs and we would all be like adding our notes in like chapter outlines yes 
very vaguely, but yes, I do. I do remember that. Yeah, and it was like a super study guide. Yes, it was like like 60 literally pages. everybody's brain was in the. Yes, yes. it was sixty pages. Oh my Awful. god! But it was like a huge collaborative effort. Yeah, and so as a instructor for a class, I've um, created a study guide Google Doc for the students. And I also have access to it. So I've like included a table. So if they have a question that they come across, they can like write their question to me and either I can respond or another classmate can respond. So I think that that's that's helped them like form those groups as well. Yeah. I feel like, well, I guess we implemented that in our program, but I'm sure that there are probably more like resources that people have learn to come up with that are more like online as opposed to like all, you know, being in study groups, you know, after the last few years. Yes, definitely. And I think that, um, like having those collaborative documents helps, Mm -hmm. but also like zoom, Google Meet, like all that stuff, you can just like hop on a call real quick and be right there. And I think that that's something that, Mm -hmm. um, the pandemic helped kind of grow, Um, Yeah, that sort of buy into using those formats. I feel like now I would like I remember sometimes being in a study group with like four people and there'd be like one person that you're just like not vibing with. And then, like, it would be nice to just, like, leave the chat (laughs) and, like, go into another chat. Like, oh, I got to go, you know, I got to do this other thing. (laughs) Just hop into somebody else's. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, Like, oh, I got, you know, the dog has to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that it's different. I'm sure that there are, you know, what other ways do you feel like nursing school now has changed since we went? So as far as like clinical aspect goes, Mm -hmm. do you remember us having to go to the hospital like the day before our actual clinical Yeah, and pick our patients? Yeah. So I'm not sure if it's no longer allowed or if my program just doesn't implement that, Um, but they're not doing that. So Hmm. they show up to clinical and that's the first that they've heard of their patient. Maybe they don't know what their diagnosis means. And then they're spending like a lot of time looking things up in clinical that you and I in our class had to look up before Before. getting there. So, I mean, it has its pros and cons because, I mean, that time that it took to drive to wherever we had to drive to, because we had to drive long ways for clinical. Yeah. So that time to go the day before and the day of. So they're not wasting that time. Um, And then they they have a lot of stuff to do at clinical because they have all this new information that they're looking up and all their care plans that they're developing and everything like that right on the spot. And Mm. I think that's more realistic to what nursing actually is because you don't go in the day before and look your patients up, right? Right. Yeah. You don't like get prepared for the day, the day before. Right. That's very true. But like how, well, how has care plans changed? Have they changed at all or are they the same (laughs) long document? (laughs) So I think if I remember correctly, we had to do care plans for like every patient. Yeah. You had to do them for every patient. I just remember the meds. I remember having to like, you know, Jane Doe that was like 89 had 20 different meds and you had to look up what they are for and I I don't even remember all the things that you had to look up but I remember just going through and being like my lady has 20 meds yes (laughs) like I got a lot of work to do and we would kind of pick our patients based on the least amount of meds because (laughs) that was the least amount of work as bad as that sounds but that was like because we had we went to pick them out that afternoon and then we had until the following morning to develop the care plan and turn it in and it was like a long document yeah it was So, so long Yeah. um, But at least the way that my program does it, we only have like one or two care plans due a semester. Oh, so instead of, well, what did we used to do? Now I can't remember. Was it before every clinical? I think it was each week for each patient. We had to turn something in and then like our evaluation Mm -hmm. portion of the care plan, like evaluating if our 
interventions worked um, that yeah. we would kind of do a follow up in our journals or something like that. But this one, um, yeah, they just have, I mean, my sophomores only have one graded care plan this semester. So good for that as far as like a workload. Um, yeah. But I feel like we were prepared when we went to clinical. We knew our patient. We knew their meds. Yeah. We knew what interventions we already wanted to implement. And yeah. we kind of had like our plan set for the day. Whereas here they're more thinking on their toes, which I think is mm-hmm. good for more senior level nursing students, but sure. as sophomores or as first semester um, nursing students, I think it's tough to just walk yeah. in and be like, oh, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to do it and go and do it. So, yeah. Well, I feel like that kind of tracks as I've talked to a couple other nursing professors recently, and they've talked about kind of moving away from some of the, you know, all of the book work, I guess, or like trying to kind of like revamp nursing education to make it more, you know, uh, manageable or, or kind of hands-on and, and I guess, yeah, like as you go kind of thinking as opposed to just doing, you know, work to do work. Yes. And I, I'm not against, um, not having a care plan every week. <laughs> I mean, I just remember the struggle and the stress that that put on us because we were in the library until midnight and then we had to wake up yeah. at five and go to clinical and that's not healthy for anybody. Yeah. And I feel like care plans, I mean, they, it's interesting because they really are like a foundation of, of nursing in a way. Like, yes, if somebody's at risk for falls, what are you going to do to prevent them from being at risk. But now in the hospital, a lot of that stuff is streamlined so that it's in the electronic medical record so that it's kind of embedded into your work day. So like you're not, it's not like in the forefront of your mind almost like it's like, I'm going to fill out this Johns Hopkins fall scale. And I know that they're a fall risk. And then it tells me what things are, are, I should be implementing, you know? So it's, it's kind of, you know, it probably makes sense for care plans to not be like the forefront of, you know, nursing school, because that's kind of something that is, I don't know, it's in our EHRs. Yeah, it's definitely becoming more integrated and kind of like a step by step, a less, I don't want to say less thinking, but the computer does a little bit of the work for us. So we don't have to create as much. We just have to like input data and then based on that data implement whatever it suggests. Yeah. I think, I mean, the computers are amazing and I think that they really only, they, they do so much for us. I mean, they're not going to be able to critically think for us. And I think that's something that in nursing school it seems like they're hitting a little bit harder, you know, critically thinking aspect or like situational, you know, things, which I think is important because, yeah, like like you said, I mean, I think the computers and medical records are there to kind of reduce human error by like identifying these different problems for you. It's a helpful tool, but it can't do everything. So it's nice that nursing schools are kind of feel like they're set up a little bit more for like, I don't know, the things that you're really going to have to know that you're not going to be helped with as much. Yeah. And I think like, just like what you said, using your computer and your charting system and everything like that as a tool to guide you, I think that that's really important because the computers are going to give you a little bit more like cookie cutter medicine and not every patient is going to fall within those parameters. And you still have to be able to think about, okay, these interventions didn't work for this patient. Like what else could I possibly try that will work? Are you interested in taking your nursing career to the next level? B.E. Smith, an AMN healthcare company, is looking for qualified nurses to fill exclusive interim unit supervisor roles. This could be the travel opportunity you've been looking for, so apply now while positions are available. Click the link in the description box to contact a recruiter today. So I want to talk about our 
nursing school experience a little bit because we survived nursing school <laughs> barely and barely <laughs> don't say that <laughs> no we did we passed with flying colors what are some of do you remember some of your firsts or you know things from skills or or just like you you know your first patients or like do you do you remember nursing school and like do you use those memories to implement like how you teach nurses today huh um so I think back on like the first time that I tried to get an IV I say tried because it was not a successful attempt um but I I I just remember remember going to the patient and I had like you know reviewed the process I knew what I was doing I was scared because putting an IV on a mannequin arm feels very different than an actual human arm. Um, But I remember going up to the patient, tying the tourniquet and starting to go towards her with the needle. And I saw that my hand was shaking. Shaking. So bad. (laughs) And I had to stop myself. I was like, she's probably terrified seeing her like nursing student, like convulsing here. Um, (laughs) So She's like, like, can I please get like somebody to, nobody wants to be the pin cushion for the nursing student. I know. So I had to like take a second, take a deep breath. And then I got my hand to stop shaking. And then my leg was like shaking uncontrollably. But I was like, okay, well, that's, <laughs> that's better. <fine. laughs> the leg is fine. I don't that's need the fine. leg. <laughs> oh so my I do remind my students, like just kind of based on that. And I tell them that story probably every semester. Um But I remind them, like, it's okay to be nervous. Like, it's normal to have those, like, hesitations and some fears and things like that. But just don't let your patient see that. Like, your patient should see that confident um, appearance, whether it's a facade or not. Um, But you should, like, emulate that confidence for your patient or else they're going to get nervous, too. Yeah. Well, and I think it's important to say is that you can be new and still be confident. You can have confidence and you know patient rapport it's like yeah I don't know you know I've been a nurse for like you know three months but I know you know but I can be you know amicable to my patients and if I don't know something I can let them know that you know I don't know that information but I can go find that information or you know it's it's you always have somebody that will know that information so it doesn't have to be you right off the bat so you know, nursing student. And, you know, I think new nurses don't give themselves enough credit because, you know, being experienced is not everything. Maybe that's an unpopular opinion, but I think you know so much, you've studied so much, you have all of this book smart and that a lot of that gets lost when you, you know, the further out you go from nursing school and like, you know, so much. And I think like, nursing nursing students probably they don't see the value in that but you know because you know you you probably don't know what to do at every waking moment like while you're in clinical but like you do know a lot and like you should you know remember that and pat yourselves on the back and like you know don't get overwhelmed when you're when you're in clinical yes i i wholeheartedly agree with that Um, whenever I have like students and even, you know, when I was bedside and I was precepting a student, um, I would introduce them to the patient and be like, this is so-and-so she's my nursing student. She's a senior. She's doing graduating. Um, she has the latest and greatest knowledge of the nursing process and just kind of like talk them up because they do know a lot and they have gotten like the most recent evidence-based practices and things like that in their education. So I think that that's really important to highlight. And Mm -hmm. I mean, experience, that could be experience with a lot of bad habits too. So exactly. Yeah. You could be experienced and burned out and like not a, you know, not nice to your patients. And like, you know, you don't really have that as a nursing student. Everybody is, you know, as a, as a nursing student or a new nurse, you're, you feel like you have something to prove, you know, you're really, I feel like the, the bedside manner is so good when you start out, like, and that's something to be proud of. That's not like a a hindrance, you know? 
Yeah, they're still bright and shiny. They haven't gotten any sort of like their souls haven't been um, damaged by some, <laughs> maybe some other nurses that are burnt out and things like that. So yeah, yes. I definitely agree with that. And I will say, I'm really hoping I see a trend here. And so, and I'm hoping I'm seeing the trend and not just like, you know, have rose colored glasses on. But I think that whole, you know, burned out because nurses are eating their young. I feel like that is going away in a sense from the clinical back perspective, like for people our age, you know, like I, I don't see, and maybe it's just the unit that I'm on and that I've had good experiences, but I don't see people bullying nursing students or new nurses, like from people, you know, more so that are my age. I feel like sometimes it depends on the environment, but you know, for nursing students, like, don't let that scare you. I think that that is like, I think we're starting to like build a good culture around, you know, people are starting to see the value in like building each other up and like that nurses are going to leave if you treat them badly. So like you need to be nice to your new nurses because you're the future. Yes, exactly. And we want to keep as many new nurses as we can there at the bedside on the units and like keep that retention up and you don't get that if you make their lives miserable yeah Mm -hmm. but I definitely agree from my experience like I've seen um a lot of the nurses like really take my students in be like oh like have you seen this let me teach you about this chest tube let me show you this or I'm going in to do this I know it's not part of your skill set but I would still like you to watch And so I think that's really great. I mean, you know, wherever you go, there's always going to be like one bad egg or something. But yes, it's not the rule. That's always. Yeah. For for my experience, that's been the exception recently. Agreed. Like there's always going to be people there, you know, I'm and you'll see it for sure. But like, you know, I I I feel like it's less than when I started is is I guess what I'm saying. And I'm I hope that that's like, you know, progressing in, in the direction that I think it is. Yeah. I remember going to one of the hospitals, uh, our first like clinical and we were looking up patients and like, we didn't really, at least at that point, I wasn't super comfortable with all the charting systems and like where to find the information that I needed to find. And so I remember like looking over at a nurse who was sitting at the computer beside me and just saying, Hey, can I ask you a question? And she looked at me and she said, no, and turned back to her work. I'm like, Okay. Mm-hmm. Cool. <laughs> I'll find it myself. Oh my but, gosh. But yeah, I definitely haven't seen things like that. And as an instructor, <laughs> yeah. if I hear of things happening like that, like I will step in and have those yeah. like hard conversations and things like that because I'm my student's advocate. So right. and I want them to have the best experience possible and they yeah. can't have that with those sorts yeah. of attitudes. But I would mama bear. Yeah. Mama Bear would come out like, I'm sorry, what? No, you're going to answer this question. Yeah, exactly. Oh, my gosh. Do you remember your first code? Yes, I do. I oh. Mine was in nursing school. Oh, really? Mine was Yeah, that. it was on, it was on, um, it was, <laughs> I, <laughs> I think it was just regular like gen med floor, but a guy had a GI bleed and he was on the commode and he just like had this massive bloody stool stood up and passed out. And I remember the nurse was like, <laughs> I don't remember. She was a little bit older and like not very tall, not very big, but she was like holding all of his weight. And she was like, press that blue button. <laughs> and I was like, where? I was like uh, looking at the wall, like trying to figure out where the code button was. And like, I think she ended up like waddling over with this guy in her arms and like pushing it. Cause I couldn't find it. And then there was like, you know, a code situation happening. And I think he just vagled because like once we had him back in bed, then he was like Fine, but there was like 20 people in there and I remember our professor like pushed me in the room with the, with the glucometer she was like get in <laughs> get in there <laughs> and then she like shut the door so I like went in there and you know took a blood sugar like while everything was going on and it was like such a rush you know I guess 
And then and then I was like was not part of code for like years. <laughs> like I was just on med surge, but yeah, I don't know. That was that was riveting. <laughs> I I remember having a nursing student um like in her preceptorship or capstone or something like that. And I was I'd only been a nurse for like six months. Um, so I was still like trying to figure out what I was supposed to do. Um, and I had a patient that just, he didn't code, but he like turned gray and diaphoretic and just like not a good picture. Yeah. And so I called a rapid response, um, cause I was on a step down unit at that point. So I called a rapid response. And in the meantime, I was just like, kind of like looking around, like looking at all the information that I had. But I kind of froze and my student Mm. was just like, do you want me to get vital signs? I'm like, yes, let's do that. Let's do this. And then it kind of like got me going again. Yeah. But I tell that to my students all the time because like it's kind of embarrassing. Like as a nurse, I kind of froze and didn't really know what to do in that moment. But I tell my students like you can be that person to offer that assistance. You can, you know, get your blood sugar on a potential stroke patient. You can grab some vital signs. You can help the process because we're not all perfect. Yeah. I absolutely do that too. I freeze. Sometimes I still like, you know, in, if, if if there's like a shocking situation you just have to like collect yourself. And a lot of the times, even if you're experienced, you might not be the most experienced person in the room too. Like there's just, and like, that's okay. Like you will always have, you should always have support. You know, and especially as a, as a new nurse, like it'll it'll be okay. <laughs> yes. When we're talking about firsts, there's one that I remember with the two of us in it, and it's Skills Day. And there was one we were like learning the basics, and our professor told me to give you a spoonful of Jello, like we were feeding our patients. Do you remember this? I do. (laughs) And she was like, and, you know, it's kind of a weird nursing school is so funny in that, you know, you have a bachelor's in taking care of people. So you're learning how to like make beds and like feed people. And, you know, you're maybe doing that for the feeding somebody for the first time, like with a spoon. And so I remember she told me, she like whispered in my ear, like, give her a big bite. And I like gave you this massive spoonful of jello. And you were blindfolded, I think. Do you remember this? Yeah. Yeah. So you didn't know what was coming. (laughs) I have actually, um, because that that stuck with me, because I'm pretty sure that I was like, not really choking, but like uncomfortable, (laughs) right? (laughs) Like I didn't choke, I was fine, but yeah, I was, I remember, I remember like you like, yeah, like falling back, like going back in your chair or something like that was a lot. Yeah. (laughs) So I've, uh, implemented that a little bit in our first semester, um, student skills lab as well. Cause you know, we still do the same thing. We still have to cover how to feed a patient, what their diet orders are, all of that. And so um, I didn't work the station this semester, but I told the person that was working that station that day, I was like, ooh, this is this is good. Like blindfold them (laughs) and then like see the difference between like a big bite versus like a normal bite and like how fast you're supposed to go and all of this. And um, I had students be like, that's really hard because like we just eat like we eat, like we don't have to think about it. And I had one student be like, you know, I shovel food in my mouth. I just eat very quickly. (laughs) Yeah. And to see that not everyone does that was kind of eye opening. I'm like, yeah, like it's just all going to be different. That is, I love that you implement that too. Because yeah, it's, it's actually a really good, you know, yeah, not everybody knows like how to feed some, like that's just, you know, one of those like skills that you have to learn. And I think just like getting cues from patients, like it teaches you how to like read those nonverbals. And like, even if your patient isn't giving you those nonverbals, like just ask your patient, like, do you want another bite now? Like, how, how's this going? How's this pace? Um, And I think that 
a lot of the times nursing students think that they need to know everything. And if they don't know something, they're like, can I ask the patient this? And I'm like, yes, like they're going to be the one with the information for (laughs) you. So, right. They're an open book at this point in nursing school. Just don't be, don't be shy. Just keep asking questions. I guess from your perspective, I want to get into really, you know, tips for nurses to, you know, survive nursing school. From the instructor's perspective, what are some tips that you've found have been beneficial or things that they need to know? So from like a, I guess I can kind of like separate this like academic success versus like mental stability success sort of thing because nursing school is stressful, right? Um, so I think a huge thing as far as like academic success goes is to stay as organized as possible. Mm -hmm. Um, like as soon as you get all of your syllabi for the semester, go ahead and put due dates in whatever calendar system you use and kind of like plan ahead. Um, I know when I was in grad school, I would like put all my due dates in and then, put like the steps that I needed in. Like if I had a final paper due in um, March, I needed to make sure that I was do- had my rough draft due this week and my outlining due before that and everything. So I kind of mm-hmm. like broke it up into smaller, easier to digest chunks. Yeah. Um, and I know not everyone's brain works like that. So I also tell them just like find a system that works for you, whether it's just a huge checklist whether it's putting your dates out, um, whatever it yeah. may be, but just stay organized because things come very quickly. You know, yeah. week one, um, you're like, oh, yeah, that's not due for four more weeks. And then all of a sudden it's here and you're like, Ooh, I haven't started. Yeah. Like, oh, no. I think I used to color coat. I had a dry erase calendar, like a big dry erase calendar that I had in my bedroom. And I would color coat, I think, like the different assignments for like different classes. I'm pretty sure. I don't think I had a planner. I think that's, I think that's what I had. I don't know, but color coding is, I mean, so, so helpful. Yes. Yeah. And just keeping everything in track. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause a lot of the times when students like run into issues, it's because they have three exams this week plus two papers due And they're just like, I just didn't have time to devote to studying because I was doing this. I'm like, well, you've had these dates for, you've known about this for two months. So it's kind of hard um, as a professor to be like, like, I understand. I completely understand. Um, But at the end of the day, like, you know, you have all these responsibilities and you just have to kind of like plan accordingly. Yeah. Um, But also communicating with your instructors early on. Like I am at least of the philosophy that if someone comes to me before a due date and it's like, Hey, like I have this going on, this going on, my kid's sick, whatever. Um, and like, I just don't think I'm going to get this paper turned in by this date. If they talk to me before the due date, I'm I'm a rational person. Like, I'm like, okay, like taking another 24, 48 hours, turn it in this time. But if they just don't. That's good to know. That's, I mean, that's how I am. I know that everyone is, you know, a little different, but, but if they don't talk to me and they just turn their assignment in late, then I don't know what's going on. Did they just not feel like doing it that day? Like, I don't know what's going on. So I don't, you know, I take points off accordingly, um, versus if they would have just talked to me ahead of time and let me know, or, then I also see it as, you know, the person that has all of these different things, like maybe you're in extracurriculars, you have like other things going on, but you still, you don't know that talking to your professor is an option and you just like exhaust yourself and like stay up all night and then like drain yourself and then you have nothing left and like you get it it done in time at the deadline but at what you know at what cost you know like I I'm sure I did that multiple times where I had a bunch of things going on and I just am like no I'll like sleep when I'm dead like I'm just gonna like get this done but you know talking to your professors is always an avenue that you can just 
you know, say like, is there anything that I can do to, you know, I have all of these extra things going on. That's it. I don't, I don't think I probably ever used that. I know I didn't. School. Yeah. But I try to let my students know, like at the start of the semester, communicate with me, let me know what's going on. If there's anything in your life, like day one, especially for my clinical students, when we're like doing our ice breaking, like introduction sort of thing that everybody hates. Um, I want to know if they have like kids or like families that they take care of or something like that, that could potentially be a obstacle to them, like getting things done. So Mm -hmm. that's really nice. That's like a, yeah, that's a good, like nursing professor tip. Like get to know everybody so you can write down like who might have problems with yeah. turning things in later on. What's going on? Do we have any sick grandparents who are right. taking care of? Yeah. And I also try like I had a student um one semester that was continuously turning things in late. And if they mm-hmm. turn something in late like one or two times, I'm just like, you know. Um, but I saw a trend in it. And so I reached out to her and I was like, Hey, like, this is what I'm seeing. Like, is something going on that you can't get this assignment turned in at midnight Mm -hmm. on Sunday? Because it was, it was like a weekly journal for their clinical. Mm -hmm. Um, and she was like, yeah, like as soon as I leave clinical on Friday, I go into work that evening and then I work all day Saturday and all day Sunday too. And so Mm -hmm. having things due midnight on Sunday just isn't the easiest option for me. And I was like, Oh, well your due date can be Monday now. So it just kind of, I don't know. I try to be human. Understanding. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. I mean, it's hard to put students in a box, especially to be like, you know, this is the, your only priority because it's not, people have to pay for school. People have to like, yeah, they have other responsibilities. So it's really nice that you're able to like let down your, not expectations, but like, yeah, be a little like empathetic towards people's situations. Yeah. Be flexible. Not everyone. I mean, it's kind of like that cookie cutter medicine that we talked about. Like yeah, all students are going to fit into the same parameter. So being able to adapt and adjust, um, kind of falls on me too. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So being organized, communicating with your professors, Um, And then I think knowing your learning style, I think is really Mm. important. Um, So there are lots of different like tests that you can take online to show if you are a like visual learner, a tactile learner, or a um, like audio learner. And then using that as a guide to how you study. So if you're a visual learner, maybe look for like graphs and charts and pictures. If you're a tactile learner, maybe look for like some interactive things online or make sure that you're writing, like physically writing your notes out Um, and just kind of like using all those different tips. Because I I did one when I was in grad school. They made us do one and it gave you a list of while you're studying, maybe try doing this or doing this. And in class, look for things like this to kind of help adjust to your specific style so that things are retained a little bit better. Oh, cool. Can people bring in their laptops in class? Like, did we, did we used to do that as well? Do normally, do people normally take notes on there now? Um, I, I want to say in my, at least in my um, experience, it's like a requirement to have some sort of device in class. Oh, interesting. Cause we do so much, um, electronic stuff now. Like last semester I created like a digital escape room for lack of a better description. So cool, Brittany. <laughs> I love escape rooms. <laughs> I've never done a physical one before. Like I've never gone to one. Matt so it was kind of to me in an escape room. We love escape rooms. We've yeah. done like 15 of them. Yeah. Yeah. We love them. Okay. I, I want to try one. That's an aside. Yeah, you should. <laughs> but it was like, um, I made a Google form and they had to get like all the right answers before it let you go onto the second section of that Google form. And you had to get all the right answers here before it lets you move on again. Um, so 
it was hard. Yeah. But I think they enjoyed it. But in yeah. order to do like some of those activities that we set up, they have to have some sort of a device. And I think a lot mm -hmm. of students um, also record the lectures in class as well. Um, okay. Which for me, it's fine. I think, you know, Audible some people learners. might not feel super comfortable with it, but I never care. Yeah. Well, that's, yeah, that's awesome. So do you, do, does anybody still print out like PowerPoints and stuff or is it normally just all, all on laptops now? From what I've seen, it's all on laptops. Yeah. Um, okay. My first semester teaching, I actually told my students, I was just like, okay, put away all your devices, grab a piece of paper and a pencil, and we're going to write down something. I can't even remember what we were doing. And I had one of my students um, look me in the eye and say, Professor Roberts, I haven't written with a pencil since 2019. And I was like, no, what? Okay. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's right? crazy. <laughs> it's a different generation That's a different world and that was like a wake-up call i was like oh goodness so <laughs> like, okay showed my oh my gosh aging wild. myself asking for a pencil <laughs> yeah right get out your papers and pencils class back in That's, my day yeah back in my day we printed out all of our powerpoints and we had to look at powerpoints then and on the computer i don't yeah that's crazy. Yeah, it's a different world. It is. So from a, um, so in the two categories, we had academic side and now. Like mental like health. Mental health side. And actually like surviving. <laughs> um, yes. But I think going in, students should be aware that just because they're straight A students before doesn't mean that that trend is going to continue. It doesn't necessarily have to stop, but just the way that nursing exams are written takes mm -hmm. a little bit of time to get used to. And yeah. it's just a different way of thinking and a different way of asking questions, like the select all that apply questions <laughs> were the bane of our existence, right? Yeah. So it's just kind of like getting used to that. And if you do fail or if you don't get whatever level of success that you have deemed your acceptable level. Um, it's okay. So like give yourself some grace to adjust to all those changes because it's, it's hard. It's not yeah. like, tell me the definition of this. It's okay. So you know what this word means. This is what it's looking like in this patient scenario. So now what are you going to do with all that information that I just gave you? Yeah. So it's so different. I've heard that the NCLEX is different, right? It's like an, it's next generation NCLEX. Yes. So um, studies have shown that novice nurses or new grad nurses um, lack certain levels of clinical judgment in their first yeah. year of practice. And it leads to more medical errors. Um, but like things getting missed. So lack yeah. of recognizing those cues and those symptoms and then intervening to prevent that from escalating. Sure. Um, so the next generation in Clex is focused more on developing that clinical judgment that's needed when you go into the workplace. Um, okay. And again, I do not envy these students at all because they're tough. Yeah. Um, and I've tried to write my own um, for practice. I mean, they have a lot of different resources that they can use for these practice questions, but mm -hmm. I try to write my own um, specific to the content that I'm covering in lecture that week, just to mm -hmm. kind of give them a little toe dip in the water of this. Um, and it's, I mean, it's tough to write. They're tough to take. It's yeah. a whole different ball game. Um, well, I feel like that's just an extra step. Like in nursing school, we were taught the books and then in clinical or beyond, that's when we were taught the clinical judgment aspect. So you're asking these students to do both in that, you know, early stages of being a nurse. Yeah, I'm sure that's hard. Yeah. So some of the questions, I think the hardest one, or at least in my opinion, I, you know, I don't know, but it's the... um bow tie question 
So basically you're given like a patient's chart and the NCLEX will now let you like flip through different like pages of the Mm -hmm. chart. So you can look at their scenario, labs, vital signs, and like their head to toe assessments sort of thing. And based Mm -hmm. on that patient's chart, you have to pick the priority problem. So what's going on. And then like two reasons as to why you chose that priority problem and then two reasons or two things that you would monitor based on that. So you have like your issue in the middle and then two things on the side. So when you like drag and drop all of your options in there, it looks like a bow tie. Interesting. That's actually, that's a really great, you know, layup for layout, I think for, for clinical judgment. I think it's great. And I think that they like it requires that higher level of thinking. Yeah. um, But they're hard. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, it's not all going to be like, you know, DKA diabetes. (laughs) You know, it's probably, yeah, there's, there's probably a, a lot of like, you know, people are complex, you know, it's, they have a lot of things going on, you know, congestive heart failure looks like, you know, all over the place as far as things that going on. Exactly. So it's like finding that like priority. And I mean, yeah. yes, this patient could have, you know, shortness of breath issues. They could have lack of perfusion issues. They could have all these other issues, but like, which one are you going to actually treat first? Yeah. And that for me, at least in nursing school, was difficult because I was like, I'm going to treat all of these things. Right. Yeah. So it's yeah. like really picking that like thing that you would hone in on first and would be like the most life threatening, I guess. Do they still prioritize like the? do they still do like the ABCs of nursing, like airway, breathing, circulation? Is that normally like the answer? Like if somebody's OK, okay. most likely. Just making sure yes, that yes. my old geezer self is like still still teaching my my students, my new grads the right thing. That hasn't changed yet. <laughs> okay, good. I think we'd be in trouble. They're like, oh actually, fall risk, that's the biggest thing. I know. I'd be like, mm, I'm good. I've, I've served my <laughs> decade as a nurse by. Yeah, right. Can't teach a old dog new tricks. Yeah. Yeah, give yourself grace to not be perfect. I think that that is that is a great great advice. We need, you know, nursing school is very hard. And yeah, like we it was so hard to get into the program and then you're amongst all of these people that are also type A and, you know, have always done well their whole academic career and it's just not, yeah, it's a whole nother ball game and it's okay. And the n- professors know that your other nursing s- students know that just give yourself some grace. I remember at um, JMU, so I was a transfer student. I transferred in as a junior um, and I talked to my academic advisor. It was like the semester that we were all applying for the mm-hmm. nursing program I was talking to my academic advisor. I was just like, okay, like I apply, here are my essays. Like these are my grades so far. You know, the plan is to get accepted and then start nursing school in the fall. And he was like, ooh, um, you should probably have a plan B. And I was like, what are you talking about? I have a 4.0. And he was just like, well, that's not always, like that doesn't always guarantee. And I was like, you're telling me. Like, you're telling me I have straight, there's no better than I can do than a 4.0, technically. <laughs> yeah. And, but I mean, that's how competitive nursing programs are. It's yeah. like, just because you have perfect grades and you have experience and you have this and that and everything else, like, doesn't always guarantee because the people who are applying for those programs also meet that criteria. Right. Um, thankfully I like got in and everything's fine, but yeah, when he told me that I was like, I thought I was the only type A person here. Like, man, there are other, there are more of us. Yeah. So, and then we all met each other and we're like, ah, get it now. Ah, yes. And just circling back to being with each other, you know, I think that's another really good, you know, academic tip is that you have to 
have a group to study with. You have to, you know, find other people to bounce ideas off of. And I think that definitely got me through my nursing school. Yes. And then once all the exams are finished that week, have those same people go and you know, like get a drink or relax and do something social and not within like nursing school. I think like yeah. finding that work life balance, um, it can be hard because, you know, they have so many things to do. But I always remind my students like watching an episode of The Office or whatever is not going to derail you. Like it's 20 minutes. You have 20 yeah. minutes to devote to yourself. Like take a walk outside, go play with your dog. Like yeah, do something for yourself because if you don't, then your tank is going to be empty and yeah. you're not going to be able to keep going. I mean, nursing school is a marathon. So you got to like take those breaks and relax. Yeah. I remember we used to be in the library all day studying for something and it's like at, you know, 2 p.m. you're just a dead like you need to you need to go out and do something you need to get some fresh air yes go you know not talk about nursing like go to lunch with your friends or you know just like get yourself out of the library or wherever you're studying and just like replenish your energy a little bit and then you can focus because you can't there's no like nobody can stay focused for like 12 12 hours you know no Yeah, not at all. I remember um, one of our classmates brought like her, it's almost like a checked luggage suitcase because we had so many books and she would bring that to the library. Oh my God. She was like, this is the only way I can carry it. I'm like, yep. We're really (laughs) like checking in here for the weekend, aren't we? (laughs) How do your nursing students feel going into the profession? Do they feel ready? Do they feel, you know, like what are their, I haven't really, I mean, other than the nursing students that I've like taught on capstones, like I haven't really, I don't know. I don't have the finger on that pulse, you know, as much as you probably do. Like what are people, what do they think going in? So I think, I think they have some anxiety and hesitations um, more so before they get to their preceptorship or their capstone. Um, mm-hmm. And then once they get into their capstone and they're like, oh, this is really what is expected. They're able to follow that nurse with her schedule for an extended period of time. They get to spend enough time on a specific unit to kind of get the feel for that unit and the expectations and the flow and the charting and everything like that. And I think that that's when all those pieces start to really come together. Um, Because up until that point, you know, most of our clinicals are seven, eight hours. So they don't really get that like shift hand off. They don't get to necessarily see a patient go for a procedure and then come back and recover that patient. Um, They're missing a chunk of kind of the process. And then they're only there once a week. And so they don't really get to see that continuity. Um, Mm -hmm. So I think going from like my seniors that I had last semester talking to them They voiced a lot of anxiety, but talking to them this semester, they're like, oh, yeah, I'm ready. Like, this was so good. I understand so much more now. I'm putting those pieces together. Um, That's awesome. So I think once you get through the final semester, it's like the the boss challenge in video games or something like that. Like once you get through that, you're you're pretty good. I mean, I don't think that anyone goes in on their first day feeling completely prepared or ready. And I mean, I know that I like, no matter what job I worked the first day I came off of orientation, I never felt 100% ready. And I think that that just speaks to having like a almost respectful fear of not fear, but respectful hesitations of what we're Yes, a healthy respect for what we do, because if we make a mistake, it could be a person's life. So I think it's hard to really have 100% confidence coming off of orientation or going into the field based on what we do. 
Yeah, absolutely. I think, yeah, there's no way to take that away, that, you know, to be 100% confident. But I was just, you know, hoping that nursing students are going into the profession now feeling, you know, like they see nursing shortages around them or they see burnout and, like, you know, problems with retention. And I, like, hope that they're coming into the profession with, like, fresh eyes and, like, motivated and, you know, because they are, like, you guys are the future. Like, you know, we're trying to turn things around right now on on the clinical side and, and being better for you guys. But it's it's also, you know, I hope that they know coming into this, like, it's a it's a group effort to try and, you know, better our units and, like, the climate and culture on our units. Yeah, for sure. Um, so... I I reached out to my um, couple senior students just to kind of like get their perspective on entering the workplace and especially in relation to um, post-pandemic kind of like workspace. So it's no secret that nursing shortages are real and everywhere has their staffing issues and it's just, it's a struggle. Um, Yeah. And so I challenged them to have a positive spin on coming into the workplace after the pandemic. I was like, this could be hard. Like, I can't really think of a positive post-pandemic that wasn't there pre-pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. Um, But I had one student get back to me and she, oh my gosh, her email was so eloquently phrased, but ultimately it said, I think that the pandemic has challenged us more so than it has in previous generations as nursing students. And those who did not truly have a passion for nursing may have decided it wasn't for them. So the pandemic has produced nurses who truly want to be here and truly have that passion and are ready to work and enter this workforce and care and provide that like quality expertise and care that the patients deserve. I was like, that was that. really good. That is really encouraging. And yeah. I, yeah, I hope that that is, I hope that's true. Yeah, I, that's awesome. So I was, I was reading that and I was just like, I didn't think of it that way. Yeah. But right. I Most mean, people probably left, you know, if they, they see all of this ahead of them and they're like, Probably is not for me because I mean, nursing and healthcare is on blast for years, you know, like all of, all of the wounds of the healthcare system were completely exposed, I think for everybody to see. And I think, and I was wondering like during that time, you know, nursing students are looking at that, like, do I want to be, do I want to be in this? So, I mean, that's awesome that she has that perspective. Like, yeah, everybody that, that stayed like you, they see the wounds and they're coming in. Yep. (laughs) They see that it's not all sunshine and daisies and they're still ready to get in the trenches with the rest of us and put in the work. And yeah, it it makes me hopeful. Yeah, absolutely. I'm hopeful for the future. Well, I think it's just going to get better. I, I hope so too. I think that we, well, you know, it can't get any worse in 2020. (laughs) (laughs) Goodness. Let's hope, let's hope not. Well, this was a great conversation. I'm so happy that I could have you on and talk about nursing school and it was great to catch up. Great to reminisce and, you know, be thankful that we're on the other side of nursing school this time. You're a wonderful professor and you sound like you have a lot of empathy and, and, you know, awareness and understanding of your, your students. So they're very lucky to have you ready. That brings us to the end of the show. Thanks for tuning in to Nursing Uncharted. To learn more about today's episode, make sure to explore the show notes at AmericanMobile.com slash Nursing Uncharted. And don't forget to subscribe so you never miss a guest. If you're a nurse interested in traveling, visit AmericanMobile.com to explore the largest database of travel nursing jobs in the industry and the amazing benefits that American Mobile has to offer. Also, a special thanks to producer Jonathan Carey, assistant producers Katie Schrauben and Sam McKay, and Aiden Dykes for the music and editing. Until next time, take care of yourself.